How many of you remember when you first heard the voice of God call you? What did it sound like? Two words. What did it smell like? Sweet. What did it feel like? Two words. I first felt like I heard the voice of God when I was nine. And I was sitting in Christian Unity Baptist Church in New Orleans, Louisiana, and my favorite preacher, Reverend Audrey Johnson, was getting up to do a sermon, and I loved Reverend Audrey, because Audrey told stories, okay? She was a storyteller, and as a nine-year-old, I had to, you know, I, that, that engaged me, otherwise I would have been bored or sleeping. So when Audrey was preaching, I got excited because she was a storyteller. And I remember saying, I want to be a preacher when I grow up. But then that went away. But I still st told stories. I still was a storyteller. I became an actor and I became a writer. And that's how I got to tell stories. And I thought that that's what my calling was. And then the voice of God came back over and over and over again. And I remember one moment when I was about 25 or 26, and I heard the voice of God commissioning me to do this work. And it was quiet. It was, it was silent. And I thought, wait, that's it, God? Like, I don't get no burning bush or nothing, God. Like, Moses had a burning bush. Where my burning bush at? I don't get, you know, a, 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 a chariot flying through the air like Ezekiel. I don't get all, I, got, I just got a quiet voice that said, go forth and do this work. And I said, but God, like every great person who had been called in the Bible, I said, I'm not qualified for this. I'm not cut out for this. What do you, wh why did you choose me? I'm a storyteller. And God said, that's why I chose you. Because you're already doing the work that I am calling you to do. And this is where we meet Isaiah today, in the sixth chapter. Amen? This is where we meet Isaiah today, in the sixth chapter. We meet Isaiah, right, this prophet to Jerusalem and Judah. And unlike many of the great leaders, we don't get much about Isaiah, right? We don't have any stories of him as a boy, right? There's no, there's no, in Moses we had stories from childhood. We don't get that with Isaiah. We know that he doesn't have as much power as the kings, and he doesn't have much, as much power as the priests, but we don't know much about him but what we do know is that he has visions. Isaiah had a vision, many visions, and it seems that his gifts had made room for him. His visions had made room for him, and this is why God had called him to do the work. We see a steady performance of Isaiah's duty. His duty for the cry for justice and righteousness on behalf of his people and his land. But the placement of Isaiah's call isn't until chapter 6. We have to get through five chapters of Isaiah already doing the work before we get to his call and his commissioning. And I thought, you know, some of us are waiting we're waiting on God to commission us. We're waiting on God to reveal to us our purpose in life. But what if God is waiting for us? Waiting for us to activate, waiting for us to initiate something. Maybe you have been waiting on the right title to do the work. Maybe you have been waiting on the right pulpit or from affirmation from the white pastor. But what if you started moving? and shaking some things. Isaiah is moving and Isaiah is shaking by the time we get to his call and his commission in chapter 6. And like every great person who has been called, what does Isaiah do? He rejects it. Isaiah says to God, but God, God, I have unclean lips. What I love about God and the people who were called by God is how imperfect they were. 
Many of them felt unqualified to do the work that God was calling them to do. Almost every person called by God rejects God. God, I have unclean lips. Moses tells God, God, I, I'm not an eloquent speaker. That's my brother Aaron. You got the wrong person. Gideon tells God, but my clan is the weakest in Israel. And, and then here comes Isaiah. I have unclean lips. But the thing that I love about God is that you don't have to be perfect to serve. You don't have to be perfect to march. You don't have to be perfect to love your neighbor. You don't have to be perfect or have an advanced degree or make a lot of money or be part of the in crowd. God will use you anyway. God, I have unclean lips. And, and God doesn't just move to the next person. God's, God, God ain't like, yo, bro, you got some chap lips, bro. I'm about to... I'm about to move on to somebody who got some lip gloss on because you really just not qualified for this. No, God says, I'm going to use you anyway. Go, take the coal, put it on your lips, purify yourself because I'm going to use you anyway. God can use each of us right where we are, unclean and untidy, messy and mean. God is not waiting for us to be perfect, perhaps God is waiting for us to say, here I am, send me. Despite the trials and despite the economic turbulence and despite the political tribulations, God is waiting for us to say, look, I may be poor and struggling to pay this union tuition, but here I am, God. I may be broken. My family may have disowned me, but here I am, God. I may have a complicated past and an uncertain future, but here I am, God. Perhaps it is because we are poor and we are broken and we have unclean lips that God finds favor with us. And so Isaiah says, yes. Isaiah says, here I am, send me. And that's easy, right? That's the end of the story. If it were up to the lectionary, it would end at verse eight. We wouldn't get into the rest of the story, right? But here's the thing. Isaiah says yes, and, and then God calls him to deliver devastating news. Isaiah says yes, and the underbelly of this miraculous and glorious call is exposed. My life since I said yes to God has been a tumultuous roller coaster. Anybody else in here has had some tumultuous experiences? This little ministry thing has been the thorn in my side, the nightmare that won't go away. There are days when I don't know if I'm being baptized or if I'm drowning. Days when the commissioning is met with confusion, when the anointing is met with anguish. After Isaiah says, here I am, send me, God calls Isaiah to deliver difficult news to a people who have already suffered so much. News like, they'll kill you in your own apartment and say it's your fault. News like, yo, Puerto Rico, you know, you ain't got electricity and you won't have electricity for a while because your government has abandoned you. News like, hey Flint, that clean water you've been waiting on for four years, it's not coming. It's not coming anytime soon. This is what God calls Isaiah to. God wasn't calling Isaiah to luxury vehicles and private jets, to fancy suits, designer church hats. God wasn't calling Isaiah to that. Saying yes is not easy. In fact, as this story has shown us, saying yes means stepping into the fire. It means going into the destruction, going into the devastation. This is a difficult yes. And the unfortunate thing is that we can't control what God is going to call us to do. Even amidst Isaiah's skepticism, he moves forward saying yes 
to God, yes, to the mystery, despite the human yearning to know everything and to control everything. See, we like to know everything before we do it, right? We like to know what the end is going to be, what's going to happen, and when it's going to happen, and how it's going to happen. But perhaps God is calling us to say yes to the mystery, to take the first step, even if it means redemption and reconciliation seem far away. Isaiah wasn't naive. He'd been doing this work, at least for five chapters. He'd been doing this work long before his commissioning. He was familiar with the long and harrowing struggle of his people, of the stories of his ancestors in the wilderness for 40 years, yet he still stood before God, knowing everything he knew, and said, send me. My friends, when the time comes, will we be able to say, here we are, send us? Knowing everything we know about the call to do the work of justice and to love mercy and to walk humbly with God from Isaiah and from Gideon and from Esther and from Jesus and from Peter and Gandhi and Martin and Malcolm and Asada Shakur, could we still firmly stand before God and say, here I am, send me, send me to stand against the empire. Send me to hold our government officials accountable. Send me to fight for our children at the border, even if it takes years to get a resolution. Could we stand firmly in that yes? Knowing all we know about the evils of this world, knowing that we might not see the fruits of our labors in our lifetimes, could we say yes? Could we say yes, not tomorrow, or next year, when we get our lives together, when we get our money right, when we get our little MDivs and STMs and MAs, but could we say yes to God right now? Could we say, God, I know the road isn't easy and what you sent me to is a mystery, but here I am, send me, here I am, send me, here with me. we say, God, I may not be qualified, but I'm available. I may not be Angela Davis or Bishop Curry or, Curry or, or Reverend Barber, but I'm available. Send me. I might not have this life thing all figured out yet, uh, but I'm willing to do the work. Send me. And could we trust that whatever fire God is setting inside of us will remind us that God is with us, that God trusts us, that God loves us. If you are okay, I want you to touch your neighbor's hand if you feel comfortable. And I want you to turn to your neighbor and I want you to say, God is with you. And that God trusts you and that God loves you. So step into the mystery. Tell your neighbor, step into the mystery. Step into the fire. And know that God is with you.